Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeanette Wright. I'm the State Librarian, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here for the, the final in the 2013 Game Changer series. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we're gathered and pay respects to those traditional owners and their ancestors. The location of the State Library here on Kirilpa Point is a traditional meeting ground for local Aboriginal people. And we're very proud to continue that tradition here today. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome um, Tim Fairfax, who, who is a major donor for the program, but I'm not sure if Tim's here. Anyway, um, Professor Peter Little, who's the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Corporate Programs and Partnerships at QUT, and really the, one of the founders of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame. Um, Ray Weeks, the chair of the CEO Institute, who will be our very capable uh, facilitator and interviewer this evening. Screw Turner, our special guest, the founder and CEO of the Flight Centre Limited. Members of the Library Board of Queensland, the Queensland Library Foundation, the QUT Business School, and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame governing committee members. And most of all, I want to welcome and thank our generous donors and partners, Origin, Crow Horworth, Channel 7 and 4BC. So you can see this is a very much a collaborative enterprise. I want to thank you all for being here tonight because this program, the Game Changers program, was the first time we've run it this year, but it's an extension of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame. So rather than just having the Hall of Fame, we wanted to make it clear to people that this is more about actually gathering the histories of the businesses that are uh, significant in Queensland and making those accessible for future generations. The Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame is about celebrating, recording and telling those stories of outstanding Queensland business leaders and their contributions to Queensland. And as we heard today at the Business History Symposium, business history is our history, the stories of enterprises, of families and communities. And often people don't think of the library as associated with business, but it's very much our responsibility to work with business organisations and with individuals to capture those stories and to make sure they're there for future generations of enterprise and business people, but also uh, Queenslanders generally. Tonight, we're privileged to hear the story of Flight Centre founder Screw Turner, who revolutionised the face of travel and was recently labelled by BRW as Australia's most entrepreneurial CEO. I'd like to welcome Ray Weeks to the stage to begin tonight's conversation. Well, good evening and welcome to this uh, final event in the first of our Game Changer series of events, and there will be others after this. And what a way to end the first series of events with Graham Screw Turner, uh, the founder and CEO of Flight Centre. As uh, Jeanette said, just to reinforce this, he's one of our most successful business leaders, entrepreneurs, and he is a true game changer. Screw Turner built a global business that is now one of the world's largest travel agency groups with over 2,000 leisure, corporate and wholesale businesses across 11 countries with a turnover of more than four, more than $7 billion a year. Now, Screw's going to share with us tonight his stories, his insights and the key lessons that he's learned along the way. He'll describe how he built his company, engendered creativity, uh, inspired teams, made Flight Centre one of the best places to work in Australia, and that's been gauged a number of times. He, how he managed the dynamics of change, and also how he drove remarkable growth. It's just interesting that in 1995, when the company listed, it had a market capitalisation of $70 million, and today the market cap is $4 billion. So it's an incredible growth story. We'll also hear Screw's views on the leadership that works for him. You'll understand tonight why Graham is not your usual corporate leader. He's down to earth, none of the usual trappings of success. 
He's highly disciplined and he, focused on, he does focus on what matters. So, and I'd like to also welcome Jude here tonight, uh, Jude Turner, so thank you for being with us, Jude. Please welcome a true game changer and inductee into the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame and one of Australia's most successful and effective business leaders, Graham Screw Turner. Let's, let's start by going back to some of those early days. and uh, let, Let's talk about, there was a double-decker bus uh, and you were at the wheel with two of your mates driving through Afghanistan. So tell us about those early days and also then tell us a bit, little bit about where the name Screw came from. Right. Okay, so we, we get the hard questions first. Yeah, um, yeah well, we, I, I used to be a vet for my sins and um, I uh, was... Initially, I found this first bus, just it was an old airfield in uh, Yorkshire where I was working as a vet. I had a student with me and he went and had checked it out and I convinced some of my friends that this is a good idea and we should do that. But uh, our, our first trip with that bus was a Spain, Portugal, Morocco, six weeks. I think it cost £100 if you were a passenger. And uh, two years later, we decided um, that wasn't quite adventurous enough, so we should take a bus through from London to, uh, to Nepal. Now, I'm, I'm not sure whether it had been done. Uh, these buses are quite low, um, but we have the beds on board, kitchen on board, so you know, it's certainly designed for long distance travel, and uh, that's where we were. We, we, um, unfortunately, that overland, uh, it no longer happens because, uh, you, you know, you probably heard about Afghanistan war and that sort of thing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, but but we had a golden few years, um, and uh, we went from one bus there just doing that overland in 1975 to I think in 1978, 79, um, the same departure, we had 12 buses just going at one time and, and there were, you know, over the year there were 20 or 30 or more doing that particular trip, although our mate, it was mainly a winter trip, we did uh, Europe in summer. So what were some of the most valuable lessons that you learned from those, uh, those early days growing up that you, you implement in your business practices today? Um, look, the, the first thing we learnt probably that was, uh, yeah, a bit of a game changer was um, um, cash flow, the importance of cash flow. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have heard about that, but uh, probably about 79, uh, we, um, one of the things you've got to remember is we started in 73, by 79 we had about uh, somewhere between 70, 75 buses. Uh, no one would loan us any money, obviously, to buy buses, and they were not really worth a lot of money. Uh, but we spent a lot of cash on fitting them out and, and bringing them up to standard, if you like. So we had 79 buses, or uh, sorry, about 75 buses all paid for out of cash, and, uh, and growing really rapidly over that period of time. And, of course, it came to the stage where uh, I remember one day we had... Uh, when you're a tour operator, you generally print brochures, you know, these colourful brochures that you sell the trips from. And um, so our printer was quite an important person to us because it was quite expensive um, to do however 100, you know, 100,000, 200,000 brochures in those days. And uh, I remember having a lunch with them um, at an Indian restaurant in Earl's Court. And they were quite good friends of ours, luckily. Uh, and uh, after we'd had about three bowls of wine, I said, um, David, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got some bad news for you. Um, those brochures that we owe you for, we can't afford them. We, we just don't have the cash flow at the moment. This was in, you know, February, and, you, and your main cash flow doesn't start really coming in until March, April. And anyway, he by that stage was, you know, half pissed, or probably more than that, knowing Dave. And uh, <laughs> and he said, oh, um, "Don't worry about it. You know, we'll we'll sort that out later." And uh, but but that was the good side of it. It is one of the things that uh, has always stayed with us. And uh, if you know anything about Flight Centre, we have a very conservative uh, view on cash. Um, yeah, there's always people telling you you should give your cash, spare cash back to your shareholders. Um, and we have done it occasionally, but uh, we, we, got, we like our cash. And it, 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 you know, for example, at this time um, in Flight Centre Limited, at this time of the year, I think we are holding about 1.2 billion in cash. And, uh, that's the way we like it. Mm. So take us through some of the, the stages 
of, uh, of growth in your company from state to national to international, supply chain diversification, listing on the ASX. Just take us through some of the critical challenges for you and what were some of the big surprises you dealt with? Oh, um, how many hours you got? Uh, you, we started Flight Centre here in 1981. It was, it was actually owned by Top Deck Travel then and we sold out of Top Deck Travel mm -hmm. in 1986 approximately. So you, if we're looking at the Flight Centre story, the 80s was a period where we grew from one shop in uh, Prudential Arcade in Sydney near Martin Place through to probably the end of the uh, 80s, I think we had a, you know, 100, 150 shops. Uh, and, and the challenge probably came, the big challenge, I remember we were at a, um, a conference of team leaders, I think we had about 30 shops in about 1985, 86. Uh, just in Australia, we might have had one in New Zealand. And we had this meeting at the Monty Inn Hotel. Have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. It's the end of Patpong Road. Mm, yeah, You've no. probably been there too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, a few times. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we had 25, 30 shops and when people put their business cards on the table, we had, about, we had 20 or 30 different logos, names. We had names, all sorts of things. Bon Voyage, Travel, a flight shop, flight centre, Sydney flight centre, Brisbane flight centre. So... Um, that was when we decided this is the time we, we've got to standardise here. We just can't develop. We've got to develop one brand. And uh, we essentially agreed, and, and they were the team leaders of those shops were there, and everyone more or less agreed, uh, it just took a couple of years to really happen, that we'd operate under one name, one brand, and that was uh, Flight Centres International. And that's, we mainly, nearly all only did Flight Centres International. The, the next major thing is, you probably remember the first Gulf War, I think it was 90, mm. 91. Mm. And of course what happened then is international travel dried up because um, people were scared of, of flying, particularly over the Middle East, mm. and that's where most of the uh, flights went. Uh, so we had to get into domestic, and um, we, that's when we got into domestic travel in a fairly big way in uh, early... I think it was early 91, and, and that was a major change then as well. So it, it, it just... Yeah, there, there, there comes a revelation every few years. You, know, you do stupid things, you, um, um, you do things you regret, you make mistakes, you repeat them. Uh, one of the things I vow to do is never to repeat mistakes more than three or four times. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the same one anyway. You know. do a lot of, there's always plenty of different ones to do. Um, and you know, that's been... That, that's always the case in history, and it is important to actually learn from your mistakes. Mm. We are slow learners in some ways. Right? So what, what were some of the big surprises for you along the way? I suppose one of the biggest surprises, and this is just off the cuff, but um, in about 88, you know, 87, 88, we were trying to get into shopping centres. And the shopping centres, Westfield, like we are Westfield's largest... We have the largest numbers of any shops anywhere in Westfield shopping centres now. Uh, and we pay them far too much rent, of course, too. But that's another story. But um, in, in about 90, 90, we were trying to get into shopping centres and they didn't want a bar of us. Um, there was often, if there was a travel agent a shopping centre, they often had a non-complete peat clause that you, could, you, know, you couldn't put another one in, all this sort of thing. And shopping centre owners you know, looked at us with disdain as, you know, we weren't really... Um, the sort of operation at one of their shops. So we put together a little brochure, basically telling people, it was just, a, I think it was an eight-pager, telling, basically saying how great we were and, you know, um, how you'd be nuts if you didn't want us in your shopping centre because of various things. And we put in, you know, OK, we only had 30 shops now, but within, um, within 10 years, our plan was to have 100 shops, you know, and we thought, you know, will, will people believe this bullshit? You know, it does, <laughs> this doesn't sound believable that in 10 years we could have 100 shops. Well, anyway, w when we floated in 1995, which was about eight years later, we had uh, over 300 shops. So um, it, it just showed me, I suppose, that if, if you do set your goals high, and, you know, there are other issues involved in this, but if you set your goals high and you go for it, um, it, 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 you, you surprise yourself with what what you actually can uh, can do over five or ten years, because believe it or not, five and ten years in business is a bloody long time. Mm -hmm. Flight centre now houses. Coming back to the brand you mentioned earlier, flight centre houses more than thirty brands. Just describe your multi-brand strategy. How you? 
Well, interesting with brand strategy because probably um, three years ago, we had, I think we had 36 brands, and uh, so we have rationalised them a little bit. But um, we, there, there are two reasons for a branded strategy, and obviously Flight Centre is our major brand. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's by far the most well known. Uh, we, we have other brands that you probably have, might have heard of, like Escape Travel, Student Flights in the retail market, and, and others like um, FCM Travel Solutions and Corporate Traveller in, uh, in the corporate market. Uh, and generally, um, the brand is really important, and, and it's so that customers can understand um, where you're positioning that brand, how, how you're going to price it and market it and that sort of thing. And they do need to be quite con quite different, and, and that's one of the problems. W we've had um, Escape Travel, for example, started in 94, 95, and it's taken us quite a long time to get that, to differentiate it. Because people used to look at it as more or less, or internally, more or less a different coloured flight centre. So really find points of different, finding points of difference. We call them customer value propositions now. Uh, they're a bit like what you might have called old USPs. Um, we, we, we find USPs are just not adequate now to describe what you need to do um, in, in your brand strategy. And, and it's not just for customers, it's also internal. So that internally our people, uh, people on the shop floor, but our markers and that really understand what message we need to get across for different brands. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more to it of course too, and not every brand that every company does is going to be successful. You've got to be careful you don't overdo the brands. But uh, on another little story that's, I think, relevant is we started a global brand about, uh, it's probably about 2000, called uh, FCM Travel Solutions, I just mentioned. So we decided, from a marketing point of view, it's probably best to have one brand rather than two, which was Corporate Traveller and that. So we combined into one brand, all, all under globally. Uh, we're in six or seven countries then under that FCM Travel Solutions, but we found this, the corporate traveller market was more of an SME rather than a, um, a, a large company business, and we found that we just weren't adequately servicing that SME market, and we had to change it. So we brought back that corporate traveller brand after an absence of four or five years, and you know, that's, that was a very expensive mistake. Costs us a lot of business, but it's by far the best thing. It's one of our most successful brands that we have globally now. So take us through a bit more how, how you and your team managed this transition from being a, a Queensland travel agent to becoming a global player. Um, we're, we're multinational. I mean, you know, in a sense, except for FCM Travel Solutions, which is in about 70 countries, uh, quite a few of them licensed, we're essentially a multinational uh, operation. And I, I, the absolute key to it is, is we have one best way of doing things, um, essentially and we try to discipline that. But in each country, we have a, a leader that is, um, basically has a lot of autonomy within that. You know, brand standards, operational, one best way, are the two things that are, are very important, but we, we um, consult each other quite a lot on that. But the, the, the people in the, in the countries basically have a lot of, um, outside their operational practice, one best way, and the brand standards. They, um, they have quite a bit of flexibility in how they run their operation to the local market conditions. Well, take us through then the DNA, the culture of the company. Um, look, it, it, it's an interesting one. I think, uh, you know, our company now has, um, I think it's about 15,000 full-time people. Um, we, uh, our sales, uh, our sales in total now are, um, well, this year it'll probably $16 billion. Um, and, the, the, the culture is quite difficult across 11 countries, but the most difficult, you know, we, we, most of our people, most of our leaders have actually grown up within the culture, often within Australia or New Zealand or South Africa, um, you know, that's been going, or, or the UK that's been going quite some time. So generally when that happens, that's fine. Acquisitions are another matter, and no matter how much people say it's a cultural fit, um, acquisitions take, in our experience, years and years to um, to integrate, mm. and uh, a lot of people in acquisitions don't integrate. Mm. Um, they're great deal makers, but they're not great integrators. 
Well, well it's just uh, different companies have different cultures and, and um, there's no one cultural way to do things as, an, as a business organisation that's the right way. Um, the main thing is I think successful businesses do have a strong and generally fairly unique culture. Um, it might appear similar to other cultures on the outside, but when you get right into it, um, most companies are quite different, and I don't think there's a one right way to do it. Mm. Have you ever had an acquisition which is uh, more about getting a management team that you wanted into the, into the company? Probably. I mean, you know, we've done a, a reasonable number uh, of small and, and some medium to large ones, but right. you know, I can't, I can't remember many, um, m many leaders that we got out of our acquisitions. Okay. Is there a Queensland character still in the company, do you think? Um, it, it, it's very much, um, Flight Centre is very much an Australian based company. Uh, we have quite a few, we export quite a few people from here. Uh, we even e export some Kiwis, you know, which when we're really desperate. Um, so it's Australia, New Zealand, um, but it, you know, Queensland, uh, we're head office in Queensland. It's a great place to have a head office. Um, Why? What's kept you here? Probably, well, I think Jude remembers this, but the reason we're in Brisbane is when we came back, um, Jude was pregnant with our, our son, first son, and uh, well, we only have got one son, so must have been him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, we tried to buy a house in Sydney because Sydney seemed to be a logical place to have our head office, and we, we couldn't get a loan. Um, uh, for the house, we actually had a house. I think it was um, we needed. I think it was eighty-five thousand for the house, and we did, we the bank just wouldn't give us a loan, and they were probably quite smart not to do it. But we came to Brisbane. Someone knew someone from uh, who's become a friend of ours from Metropolitan Building Society, and uh, he he goes the loan straight away. So that's how it ended up in Brisbane. And uh, yeah, w w I don't think we have any regrets. Uh, Flight Centre is described as a family village triumph. It's uh, just described the families, the villages, the tribes model that you applied it to the organisation. Okay, um, I mean this is not a particularly unique thing, but one of the things we found in the 80s, um, and it was quite an early learning that uh, we had a shop in Melbourne. I think it was called Melbourne Flight Centre before we changed to uh, Flight Centres International, and. Um, it was a very successful shop in Swanston Street, I think. And um, the, the Wayne, the, um, the guy who ran it then, he's still with us, actually. Um, so, but it was very successful. We grew it, I think he grew it up to seven uh, people. It made uh, two or $300,000 a seven-person mm -hmm. shop. So we kept, we kept, well, this is pretty smart. Let's keep growing it. And uh, the next year, he had 14, 14 people on the floor in the shop. It was a long, thin shop. Um, and the profits started going backwards. And uh, this happened in a couple of other cases. So we realised that uh, 14 people is too many people for one team. Mm -hmm. um, so that became essentially the family side of it. Uh, we, we found that uh, the, the village is generally four, five or six, if you like, teams. And, um, and the tribe is generally what we call an area. Uh, we do have village leaders now, but they're, uh, it's basically an honorary position. It's one of our team leaders. For example, in Mackay, I think we've got four or five shops. One of those shop leaders will be the village leader in Mackay, but it's an honorary position. They'll have an area leader that generally has about 20, 24 shops, and that's essentially what we call the tribe. It's really probably more in hunter-gatherer terms, it's probably more of a um, sub-tribe. Um, and I think there's a lot of... Thi and, and the assess essential thing is that Nigel Nicholson, who brought this to my attention some later, he, he put some theory behind it. He was the London School of Economics, right? Yeah, yeah. and he's just released a, a book, actually. Um, um, I haven't read it yet, so I don't know exactly what it's about. But um, I read, I, I think it was in the Harvard Business Review, but that... that um, People prefer to work, uh, as hunter-gatherers, assuming you're not a creationist, you, you accept that hunter-gatherers, we've been hunter-gatherers for 98% um, you know, of the time that humans have been here, homo sapien, anyway, but um, even if you look at our, uh, for the last five million years, probably our um, ancestors have been 
uh, largely hunter-gatherers as well. And uh, so obviously there's a lot of inbuilt things that people like uh, to be. A, they, they like to be in a family. Uh, they like to be in a village. And, and even if you look at things like uh, Facebook and that, you, you'll generally find that that's probably a um, similar number to what people would normally know in a, in a group. Uh, the people they'd know quite well might be, you know, uh, very well, you know, family and, and close friends might be uh, your village site. Um, so there's a lot of parallels and basically what he was saying was applying this hunter-gatherer concept to business to, to make your business work better. And uh, um, I, I, when we've strayed from this, I, I, well, two things. I think when you stray from that, it does make your business a lot harder to manage. Um, but you also can get a lot of benefits from this uh, in terms of um, giving direction, getting change, uh, getting change happening and, and this sort of thing. So how does this work with your executive, uh, executive level, the, uh, you know, with your direct team at the executive level? How, how does it work? Um, look, we, we have quite a matrix. Um, we have, I have a team of people that report to me here in Brisbane of uh, six people. Um, for example, uh, marketing, uh, CFO, um, COO, uh, what we call people works, which is sort of like recruitment and training. Um, but probably our major strategic team is what we call the task force, which is mainly operational people plus the key overseas leaders. Mm. And, and they're basically there for um, direction, uh, for setting the company direction overall. Uh, so it, it's a slightly matrix thing, but um, that's the sort of area we seem so. But they're both basically team size. I think the task force is seven and uh, my team is six. Okay. And so how do you select the team that works for you? I mean, what, what values and behaviours do they have to demonstrate? Do they have got to care about the same things that you do? What is it? I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of uh, talk about diversity in the workforce, and I think that's not a bad thing. I suppose one of the things that we have found is that it's quite important in most cases for people to come through the ranks. Most of our senior leadership team started probably in their early 20s as a travel consultant. Um, and that's one of our challenges into the future, you know, to, to make sure we're getting the same type of people then so that in 20 or 30 years' time mm -hmm. they can come through. Um, and, and most of the people who run our overseas countries, as I say, pretty much autonomous, autonomously come, come through the ranks. We do have a few accountants uh, in senior leadership roles, mm -hmm. you know, in operational roles. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they are good, um, or they wouldn't be there, I hope, but. Uh, they, they, do, they do struggle. Um, it's like public companies that appoint a, uh, their CFO to be the new CEO. You know, it's something that I really would worry me a lot of the times because generally it's not the background that you need, um, particularly in a, in a business like ours, which is um, your people need to, it really helps if they've got a good detailed understanding of the model right from the ground up. And that can't be learned easily. Um, uh, you know, that takes years to learn. And a lot of failures will happen mm. if people don't have that background. That's, that's my only major thing. Mm. And the culture that you've got in Flight Centre rewarding entrepreneurship, you know, what are your thoughts around this? How, how do you go about increasing productivity and creativity in your organisation? Oh. I wish, I wish I knew, but um, it, with, with productivity and efficiency and uh, we've been big on incentives for a long time. Um, in, in other words, a book I read, I can't remember, I think it was What Gets Rewarded Gets Done or... Anyway, um, I can't remember. What Gets Measured was, Gets Done. What, you know. I think it was Michael LeBeuf. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he's a bit old hat now, but um, essentially we believed in that from the start. And I think essentially it's still right. Um, where, I, where you go wrong with incentives, and we've done it again and again, is that people take the lazy way. They want to change behaviour, they want to implement change, and they use incentives to do it, um, which is really the lazy way of doing it. The, the way you make change 
is that you enunciate it, give clear direction, and then have discipline in implementing it. Uh, you use incentives to make change, and OK, it can work here, but then you have to change every bit of behaviour you want. You have to change the incentives, and you end up with, with a mess. Um, to me, incentives should be there to reward outcomes that you want produced in a broad sense. And uh, yeah, often that is profit. So we're happy to reward profit or sometimes growth in profit. Um, but um, that's, it, it has been one of the things we've changed over the years. And probably not changed, but gone back to where we started from. But you've still got differentiated rewards right, right throughout. Very much Highly so. differentiated, aren't they? Very much. And, and one of the challenges is how do you reward people in support roles, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, we don't have a simple answer there. Mm. But, but certainly in sales and in leadership, reward is quite easy because it's, um, you know, you're rewarding essentially profit. We've spoken here a number of times about the CEO role being wonderful moments strung together between hours of terror. And also the, the moments where you, you lose it. Where did, where did you feel you lost it? The moments where you felt this was not going to work, and, uh, and how did you recover? Um, look, I, I think I, I was only really officially the CEO from about 1990. I think before that, there were essentially, I think, three or four of us who had reasonable shares in the company who ran out their own areas. Mm. And it was only in 1990 the other guys said, "Well, look, you know, uh, they were obviously getting lazy and they wanted someone to take." some of their responsibility away from them. But, um, and, you know, th th there's some tough moments. As I mentioned before, the first Gulf War, uh, we, we um, there was licensing coming in, travel agency licensing. It looks like we've just, you know, it's taken us, I don't know, that came in 87, I think, but um, nearly 30 years ago, we just looked like we might be getting rid of it this year, you know. and. Uh, it's just not the sort of thing, it, it was designed there basically to try to get rid of us and uh, so early 90s with the, um, with the Gulf War on, you know, we, we had our, I think it was our last two months we made a, an operating loss, January, February 1991 and um, we also had the T, the, it was called the TCF on our backs about some of the issues, some of the guarantees we need to give and that. Uh, we obviously were leasing a lot and we all had guarantees all over the place for rental and that. So that, that was quite a tough period. But um, I think, you know, we went through that. We, um, our cash flow was always good. Uh, and I must admit, you know, from a CEO point of view, I've generally had good people. We've made a few bad moves on that sometimes. But um, I, I must admit, generally, I'm fairly relaxed about that. It's, you know... September 11 was a good, you know, it was a worry. It was a worrying time for a few weeks, but mm. we decided to take it head on and, and look, we knew the travel was going to come back. We knew there'd be pent up demand. Mm. So we put a lot of effort into marketing that and really pushing that uh, before it came back. So that when it did, you know, we were just flooded in that January, February after that. We just couldn't cope with the business and, uh, and those sort of things. So you learn to sort of say, well, okay, how do you turn this around? The, the last big one was the global financial crisis. Um, that was tough. Our shares went down to three dollars fifty, and that's only four years ago. You mm. know, so or um, well, maybe it's five now. Isn't it? <laughs> you, you look go just on the share price for a moment too. Last year you're eighteen dollars. Today you're forty dollars. Mm. Your share price. But with the GFC, you've had uh, flight centres had this five-year record lows in the share price and profit. Yet you appear to rebounded financially, and you're now reporting record profits and this, this growth in share price. How did you recover in such a short space of time? Look, just by doing the basics and doing them again and again. And you know, business really, when it comes down to it, business, you've just got to keep things really simple. Focus on a few things. Don't try to focus on too much. Making it, um, if you like, uh, because business is can be very complex. It doesn't matter what business you're in. And I think simplifying that down to a, to a few things you need to focus on. And that's not easy in, in this digital age where there's so many things we, you know, we have to be um, aware of too. And, and then trying to make a, a I, I guess, a compelling argument to, to change, to, to implement those simple things you, you do. But, but as far as share price goes, there's only, you know, when you're an organisation, particularly a listed one like us, there's only one thing you can do and, and is produce genuine growth in profit. Mm. 
and uh, at some stage the share price will follow. Um, and if you, if you know what's going to happen, why it's going to go there, well, yeah, I certainly don't. So uh, I, I don't know why if it was worth $18 a year ago, it's now worth 40 you know, I, um, that, that's, that's almost like, um, that's, that's almost like a lottery. But there was a view at one stage that you've got the old brick and mortar model. There's online retailing. You've, you're just mo not moving fast enough into the online area. What's, uh, what's your view on that? Yeah, it was, pro it was probably right. We probably sh could have moved a bit earlier in some areas. But um, I, I remember reading an article in, in a US uh, travel agency magazine predicting the demise in, in very no mm. uncertain terms of, of bricks and mortar. Mm. Travel Ace, and that was 1999, and yeah, we're still here. Um, we, 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 we have an online model, you know, for example, in the Flight Centre brand, uh, we have quite a good online transactional model. One of our major strategies is to what we call a blended model, and you've heard a lot of the uh, omni-channel with a lot of retailers, um, but this is a little bit different. It's, it's certainly being able to do your transactions online, offline, or a combination of the two with a person. Um, we think having a person behind the transaction is very, very important, uh, particularly anything with any level of complexity. People make so many errors in the sort of products they buy when they don't know enough about it. People don't travel internationally generally um, that often uh, that they can become expert at it, at it either. But it's also, our blended travel is, is really as much as anything is taking the pain points out from the customer experience. And, you know, believe it or not, there, there are still pain points even dealing through us, let alone dealing online. So we, we've got a fair bit of work to do there to get where we really want to go with a blended model. And Screw, tell us about the risks. How, what's your appetite for risk and how well considered the risks were at each, each stage of your development? Um, I, I think in, in business, if you're not prepared to take risk, you shouldn't be in business. Uh, you know, taking risks, preferably with money, not with your life, but um, maybe if you're trading in Russia or somewhere else, it might be a combination of that. But um, no, so you have to take an element of risk. We're, we're quite risk averse. We, we don't take big lumps of risk, but you will never do anything in business if you don't take some risks. And, and, and one of those risks now is continuing to grow our bricks and mortar, um, continuing to grow our physical um, and our, our sales force uh, when, you know, in places like Australia, our South African um, uh, MD said oh, at a recent uh, meeting, we, we've got no more shopping centres to put our shops in. You yeah, know, we've got them all, basically every shopping centre in South Africa has got a flight centre in it. Well, you know, how do you get beyond that to, to the next one? And I, I suggested opening in the High Street in Joburg, but um, apparently that's dangerous. So. <laughs> Tell us about your leadership style and come, just come back to your personal leadership style as a CEO. What, what would you say no to? Um, look, I think essentially if you get the right people in the right positions, you, you've got to let them run with it. Okay, you'll, uh, you'll talk to them, you'll get up to date with what they're doing and give them advice, which they may or may not take. But I, th I think that's probably the main thing I've learned. If they're not the right people, you've got to change them. Um, if, if they're the right people, you know, you do have to encourage them, perhaps um, help them in some, some ways. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes um, they can be quite difficult to deal with, some people. Uh, but, you know, generally it doesn't worry me. The, the only thing that worries me is if I think the person's not up to the job and that you're going to have to do something about it. That, that's, that's always a tough... Um, a tough ask if, you know, for someone who's reporting directly to you. And tell me about the, um, just come back to the fear of failure in your success. Um, How important was it? Yeah, look, I think people probably have two things. You know, one is, okay, you're always, you're always afraid that you might fail uh, or that your business might fail and go broke. I mean, I suppose it's not the end of the world, um, but for some people it is. And I think, so... Fear of failure is, it's there, it's there to, you know, to stimulate you to um, get you into work in the morning and, and change things and make things happen and, and get rid of people sometimes. Um, but I, I, I think it's just in the background there. I, I think if you become obsessed with failure, you, you won't do anything. Uh, and, and it's also the same. You see people 
where, where there's a genuine fear of success. People actually almost, um, you know, do do damage to their business or parts of their business because they're they're deep down they're worried they're going to be too successful if um, if this you know if it goes the way it's looking like mm. and and you know somehow that success will suddenly make the expectations higher than, and higher and higher and they won't be able to live up to it at some stage, you know. Mm. So we're going to come to you very shortly, so if you could just uh, get ready for, uh, for questions. And there's a roving microphone coming through, but just before we do that, Screw, where to from here for you? I mean, wh what are your key opportunities in the medium and the long term and wh what Flight Centre likely to look like in five years' time? Um, it's quite interesting. We've just we've just had a, um, if you like, New York. We did the Northern Hemisphere uh, budgets and growth plans uh, mid-May. Uh, then in Hong Kong, we did Asia, Middle East, and we just did Australia last week here. And uh, and basically, it's it's about numbers a little bit, but our, most of our budgets really about growth plans for um, for this next year, 2014. Uh, and also a, a bigger picture for 2018. And, and, and I must admit, I, I, was, you know, I thought that everyone did a pretty good job in terms of painting the picture of where we're going to be. There's nothing dramatic about it, but um, I can assure you in next year, in, in a year's time, we'll look different in certain things. I mean, there, there are a whole range of areas that, um, w without going into detail or boring you, but... Um, for just for a little example in the flight centre brand across the board, besides that blended model, we're going to be doing a lot more of our own product so that a lot more um, of what you see in flight centres just won't be available anywhere else. Uh, we want to get that to probably 40 to 50% in five years' time so that it's product that people want, that customers want, that will sell, but it's, uh, it's just not available anywhere. We may manufacture it ourselves. So we become much more... And one of the ways it's been termed is moving from being a travel agent to being a travel retailer, mm. um, such as a department store might be. Uh, so so the, the, there are big plans to do this. I, I, most of it, but in five years' time, we won't look dramatically different. Mm. You know, you'll still... The shops will look a bit different. We're, we're undergoing quite a big project, what we call travel shopping of the future, because it's not just about what the look and feel of the shop is, but what actually happens in and behind the scenes of the shop. So there's a whole range of projects behind that. Um, we'll also be heavily involved in corporate. I mean, corporate now, corporate travel is 37% of our total sales. It's big and, and uh, a similar amount of our profits. But um, I, I think the Flight Centre brand will still be our preeminent brand. It'll still be the biggest brand uh, in, in, in our portfolio. And uh, it will evolve with time. The captain will still be there. He'll be looking a bit older. But uh, we've got a new captain now, as you see, and apparently the girls think he's quite good looking. So, <laughs> so in, the, in your growth strategy, then, in the next five years, what's the importance of acquisitions versus the um, organic growth? Look, there'll be very few acquisitions. Um, we've got so much potential to grow in, uh, not in Australia, let alone some of the overseas places. In, in the UK, we've got less than 5% market share of the basic travel agency business. So we've got a huge, and yeah, we're nearly up to a billion pound sales there now. So huge um, opportunities to grow organically. Uh, the, 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 where we, we might do some acquisitions, they'll only be small, but uh, for example, in uh, vertical, mm. you know, for example, I probably shouldn't give an example, but uh, <laughs> for example, we have Retail, we have wholesale. We uh, we actually have a um, a purchasing group which we call Flights in a Global, Pro which purchases hotel rooms. They sell to our wholesalers, who sell to our retailers. But uh, in place like Bali, Fiji, New Zealand, Hong Kong, where we send, you know, for Fiji, 50% of the people who go to Fiji are booked through us, mm. uh, and we use land operators to do a lot of the transfers and all that. Well, there, there we believe there's opportunities to take not only to get another slice of the pie but or the margin but to to give our customers more than what they're getting now mm -hmm. because we control that sort of thing so those are sort of things we we have a small tour operator out of the uk which is starting to go really well called back roads touring and we can just identify with the baby boomers now mm -hmm. this is small group touring it's it's getting to where the bigger coaches can't go boot smaller boutique type hotels 
but you're still travelling in a group of 14 or 15 mm. people. Mm. So, you know, that's been become very popular and we've, we've had that for four or five years. So Adventure travel as well? Yeah, well, adventure. Well, Soft Adventure, it, one of our brands is called My Adventure Store. Mm. Um, it's only quite small. We only have about 14 shops at the moment. But, um, yeah, but, but that's not so much. That's more of a retailer rather than... Uh, mm. uh, there will be more opportunities to tour operate and wholesale. And what about the impact of the uh, lower Australian dollar? 95 cents versus dollar five. Yeah, well, I don't know whether that's good or bad for us, but um, we, we're still quite big in domestic... Um, you know, domestic hotels and airfares and that too. So uh, a lower Australian dollar might make it a bit easier for people to travel locally a bit more mm. and, and maybe not quite as attractive to go overseas, but we haven't found that sort of... The exchange rate varies that much. Okay. When it was down to 45 cents to the dollar, people cut their holiday short a bit, um, maybe downgrade the hotel standard a bit, mm. but... Um, you know, generally, people still travel. Australians still travel. So do, so do our markets just about everywhere, almost regardless. They might go to different markets, downgrade or cut short a little bit and that sort of thing. But um, the main thing that seems to impact by a long shot is uh, the price of airfares. If, yep. if they go too high, uh, you know, that, that's a bit of a barrier. Uh, if they come back, people, people start going again. And yep. airfares, you know, most of you have been travelling for the last 30 years would know that airfares really, in 30 years, well, probably 40 years, airfares have not dramatically changed, but our cost of living has probably gone up five times. You know, we should be, we should be, we could be paying, well, just for example, an airfare to London in 1956, well, you, you probably don't remember that, no, no, no. it was, uh, the it took six months of the average salary, so it would be $30,000 now in today's term. So airfares are ridiculously cheap. Mm. Now, and I'll never be as cheap again. So buy an airfare. Travel now. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yeah, right here. Hi, Screw. Um, my name's Simone. I'm actually a ex-escape travel employee. Um, I was just listening to what you were saying before about the, the very stringent um, brand path that you went down. And I know that one of the values in your company is egalitarianism. Um, but I found that there was a contrast in the way that translated between brands. There's a lot of competition, um, some of it healthy, some of it not so much, between, for example, Escape Travel and Flight Centre, um, and a lot of, I guess, almost bad blood generation. Is that something, an issue that you've had to deal with in an ongoing process? Or? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you're right. Um, and uh, one of the things, how, how long since you've been at Escape? Um, right up until I got a business grant just recently to start my own okay. business. So about, oh, um, about three months now I've been out. Okay. Well, well, I think one of the things you'll know is that now, for example, with Escape, <coughs> it's an Australian structure, whereas it was a state-based. And for partly the reason that you stated, that, that there was unhealthy competition, but not only that, the, brand, the brands between Escape or, um, or Flight Centre weren't um, positioned clearly enough that we went to an uh, Australia-wide structure in Escape, run under Joel uh, and, um, and you know, her brand leader for Escape, so that, um, you know, that they can really focus just on that brand uh, Australia-wide. Now, pr one of the problems is, of course, that the support in a state is, not, is a little bit different. But I think we've seen that's happened, I think, uh, nearly 12 months now. And that's made a huge difference, as you know, with, Brands like Escape and Students over the last year have had a, a, a big increase in, um, in sales and, and, a, and a really good growth in profits. We, we've still got a fair way to go with that. But, but I, think, you know, I, I think Escape's a great brand and I think the people in it um, you know, just means it's going to be very successful. I, if I was some of the competition there, and you know who I'm talking about, you know, I would be a bit worried because they, they are a little bit disorganised at the moment. Have you ever thought of teaming up with Branson and, and making a massive conglomerate of flight, attend, flight agents selling Virgin flights? Look, I, I could not compete with Richard in any way, shape or form, I'm afraid. Changing the subject entirely, uh, could you expand on your resorts, thanks? Uh, perhaps a little bit of the history and, and what your plans for the resorts are now? 
Okay, well, I should get my wife to do that. I know you should, yes. <laughs> I'd, I'd almost suggested that. And also, I'd like to know the origin of your uh, nickname. Okay, I did, we didn't say that. Um, no, exactly. Well, I'll, I'll do the easy stuff first, but Spices Hotels, um, or Spices Retreats, um, we, we have seven of them, one in the Hunter Valley, all the others in or around Brisbane. Um, and um, it, it's essentially a boutique offering. A lot of the, some of them being built uh, essentially by Jude, you know, not physically, but design. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's, it's aimed at a relatively high end, but not, not overly expensive market. And uh, they're going pretty well. We've, we've only been, um, as a Spices brand, our initial properties were branded as Peppers, but uh, it's going pretty well. And I think if, you, I mean, it's not in everyone's, um, you know, Everyone's pocket doesn't fit this because some of them are quite high end, some of them are quite expensive, but some of them aren't. And, and it's really, a, I suppose, about the experience that we're trying to do so that you go to these places like Hidden Vale's on uh, 12,000 acres, cattle probably, we have a big koala uh, project going on there. Spices Peak is, at, um, is another large property at Cunningham's Gap. And uh, they, these are really iconic places to go and visit, and we want to preserve them. We want to um, make sure that people can go to really enjoy not just the countryside, not just the experience, whatever that might be in terms of bushwalking or, um, or uh, you know, mountain bike riding or observing nature and uh, wildlife and that, but to, to preserve it too for future generations. And we, we've got a few things up our sleeve that hopefully you'll hear about um, in the next... Uh, you know, uh, six or 12 months, which you, I think, uh, well, well, I will tell you what we're trying to do. We, we really want to do an iconic walk through the, um, on, the um, on the escarpment of the um, main range national park, Mountain State National Park, where, which would join two properties we have and that we've been talking to the government and national parks. There's quite a few good tracks already through there. It just needs linking up so that it's sort of place like Milford Track that people come from far and wide to do and that's the sort of thing that we want to do not not just because we want to do it but because obviously it helps the um, the properties as well uh, my nickname I, I got my nickname at boarding school um, and it was uh, I got to I went to boarding school when I was 15 to my grammar and um, I don't know why my parents want to get rid of me but I was quite happy <laughs> it was certainly better than uh, working more or less as a slave on the orchard um, so all you did is go and do a bit of study and play sport. I thought, OK, I'll take this. Uh, but there was a house, we had a housemaster there called Screwdriver. You might remember there was an old, and his name was Turner as well. And there was an old screwdriver called, hmm. well, I think it's probably still around, is it? Yeah. Brandon Screwdriver. So I was sort of, he was big screwdriver, I was little screw. So, and uh, I went to uni with quite a few guys from school and overseas, so it stuck. And the name, the spelling changed over time. Okay, next question. Yep, just right here. Thanks. Stop there. Um, yeah, with, with your name Screw, I mean, and uh, having uh, a captain as your image. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, is there ever any room for a female captain, maybe? And um, also, I mean, this is in, in, line, in line with uh, what happened all last week with the, the female issues that we've been having generally in, in, in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and also, just on, on that, one, one more thing, is um, I'm just wondering as a CEO, what do you think about anger? And if you ever get angry at your staff or your wife or whoever, and if you think that's acceptable at all and, and how you deal with it, if, if you do. Um, okay, look, the, the feminine issue or the gender issue, I suppose, um, I don't have a particular view on it. I, I, certainly in our organisation, okay, the captain's a guy, but, um, you know, I, I feel we, you are nuts if you don't um, both employ and... Uh, if you like, uh, give people positions on their um, on their abilities. If if you don't do that, you, you shouldn't be in business. Uh, whether and whether they're, you know, male or female, black or white, it, it shouldn't shouldn't even come into it. Uh, what was the second question? The, 
Oh, anger. Just the way you yeah, it's a good anger. one. I mean, yeah, I, I must admit I don't get angry much, but um, certainly I remember in the 70s, uh, you know, when, you know, sometimes um, people did stir you up a bit. This, this was running old buses all over the bloody world. Um, and not, some of them not looking after them, you know, that sort of thing. But I think, I think in time, if, if you're built to uh, be in business, to run a business, you know, that sort of thing, if you get angry about stuff, uh, it won't be a very, very pleasant job you've got. And I think that's one side of it, but um, I'm sure, you know, as I, I think I said before, there's still the odd time when you have to manage some of your senior people um, who are arguing with his, each other and, and getting angry, and I, I don't think it uh, doesn't help their cause at all. You know. So if I ask one of your members of your team, tell me about Screw, how do you feel about it? What, what would they say? God, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I let them do their job, basically, mm. and, uh, but try to keep an interest in... Mm in what they're doing and why they're doing it and that, and, and I'm certainly not backward in giving advice if I don't think it's right. Um, whether they, t you know, they, they quite often tell me to get stuff that that's not why they're doing it, you know, but um, generally, and, and not, not only here, because I, I have, uh, I think we've got five or six reports here in Brisbane and um, three more overseas, so, you know, it's not just here. And, uh, yeah, you just don't agree with everything, but I, in the end, you know, if Dean Smith, who runs the USA, um, if I don't agree with something, I'll tell him, I'll make sure he knows that I don't agree with what he's doing, but I can't make him do something he doesn't want to because uh, if I do he's that, I'm going to have to go and live in New York, you know, yeah, exactly. which mightn't be that bad. But <laughs> Another question? Peter? Thanks. You build a, a huge enterprise, um, and it's a multinational corporation. Um, it's a very competitive industry. Everything's competitive when you're operating globally. Um, we have vast changes going on in the world with the digitisation of everything and uh, new forms of engagement and retailing. Where do you get your ideas to take the organisation to the next level? Because right throughout the last hour you, you've sprinkled ideas about new dimensions. How much time do you give over to creative thinking and thinking about new visions for the organisation and, and where do you get your best ideas? The best ideas come after probably two thirds of a bottle of bread probably. But <laughs> um, Look, pro probably Peter, I, you know, we don't spend a huge amount of time, you know, actually thinking up things, solutions for things. There, certainly problems, we, we know we've got problems in different areas. We look for creative solutions for sure. But, uh, and um, certainly myself, I, I do try to read a fair bit, uh, particularly, and, and you know, s s a lot of business books don't, uh, don't grab me at all, but there's a few people that, um, you know, that, that uh, sort of resonate there's, some of the ideas. There's one that grabbed you. Remember, you, you told me about Good to Great? Jim yeah, Collins' well, book, that was a... Yeah, well, Jim Collins, he's got another book out. Well, it's not recent. Great, uh, by, great choice. by Choice. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, I think he's got some great ideas there. And, and he gets his ideas basically from researching companies to death and then finding out what makes them different. And uh, so, you know, there's a, a bit of credibility in there too, I think. Uh, so, um, so I, I think... But, but running a business really should be pretty simple. It, well, our sort of business. If you're going to do an IT startup and be successful, you know, one of those one in a thousand that might be successful, you know, you need to be seriously creative and that's probably not our cup of tea. Uh, and we probably don't put enough thought into some of the big picture and creative thinking that we probably should. But uh, I don't, there's no special technique. We, you know, we, we've got plenty of pretty smart people with a lot of experience, um, you know, in a company. I mean, a lot, a lot of them, most of our senior people have been there f at least 15 years up to uh, 25 years or so. And, uh, and uh, most of these people are, believe it or not, that, not that old. You know, they're generally a lot younger than me. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think one of, the, one of our standouts is a guy called Chris Galanti in, in the UK. He started when he was 21. 
He was a graduate, just graduated from university, thought, I need a bit of a, I need a summer holiday. Um, took this and uh, didn't really want to take it, but then got, you know, basically railroaded into it. And, and now he's, uh, he's running the UK, which is nearly a billion dollar uh, business. And that's, you know, so you get some really good input from people like that. Are there any business leaders that you get ideas from? Political leaders or whatever? Certainly not political leaders. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, not, not necessarily. I, I mean, there are some things, you know, um, but, but everyone's got a different way of doing things. So, you know, I think it's really interesting hearing what people are doing and why they're doing it. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, I'd be happy to give them my two, you know, two bobs worth too, but um, not, I, I don't, you know, things like Warren Buffett, I mean, you know, he, he's a, a very sage old guy and I mean, uh, you can't fault him, but, you know, he, he does his business a totally different way to the way we do it. Um, but you certainly can't fault the way he does it. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, question here. Um, back to uh, political leadership, I guess, in Queensland. Um, the, the fastest way for you to grow your business in uh, Queensland would be to help the Queensland government to grow its tourism industry, I guess, and, and, and the Queensland government it says it wants to grow its tourism industry. And you said um, airfares have never been lower. Um, you're saying the Aussie dollar doesn't really affect um, people's travel movements. So do you take a more proactive approach um, with the Queensland government in terms of uh, offering ideas on how to grow their tourism in Queensland or um, was it more responsive or reactionary and if, if you if it was if you did have some suggestions what would those suggestions uh, be? Look I mean this is one of the most difficult um, things Australia has let alone Queensland and I think uh, yeah the government Campbell Newman and the um, Queensland Tourism is it Tourism Queensland? Or tourism that, Queensland. Yeah they, they, they've put a fair bit of effort there's been a, quite a lot of changes uh, I'm not totally up with it, but we've certainly had some chats to them. Um, but it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's the same with Australia. Australia's got a lot of issues, and I know out of the UK, our business there sends... It's one of the largest suppliers of tourists to Australia, but we're really struggling uh, growing that when you've got South Africa, you know, much, much cheaper and, in, in, and selling itself quite well in terms of what what they've got there, but, you know, for tourists. Uh, I, I think in Australia, you know, we've got some iconic things like the Barrier Reef and, uh, you know, uh, Uluru and, and this sort of thing. And, and, and Sydney's, a, you know, one of the world's great cities. But um, I, there's not a lot of, I suppose, of us um, really building infrastructure, and I'm not necessarily talking about government infrastructure, but things like... Um, you know, game parks or uh, iconic, th you know, I talked about the iconic walks. You know, we've got some great walks in Tassie. There's a few others around, but n n very few of them got a gr big reputation like the New Zealand walks. So I think we've got a long way to go just with that infrastructure. And it's no use promoting and, and having great slogans and that unless you've got things that people really want to come to. I, I mean, you've got to do that. But uh, we've got to be very careful in Australia that we don't spoil what we've got as well. And, uh, you know, uh, on things like um, unrehabilitated open-cut coal mines, for example, aren't a great thing if, if you're trying to develop a tourist market. Things like, you know, koalas becoming possibly extinct in South East Queensland, when they're a great, you know, tourists want to see these sort of things. They want to see them alive, not down at Lone Pine. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of things we shouldn't be doing as well as some of the things we probably should be doing. But, you know, no one, I don't think anyone's listening to me anyway. Next question, Danny. Thanks, Chris. I'm interested in your perspectives on entrepreneurship in Australia, particularly among young people. Uh, there would be a lot of people who would argue that university graduates in Australia are much less predisposed to want to start a business than to get a job and particularly a global business as, as you've been able to create. Have you got any perspectives on that and do you think there are things that the corporate world can do to engage in stimulating more entrepreneurship? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, I, I graduated, well, I don't know how long ago, it must have been 40 years ago. And I mean, um, y you know, 
you could do things then with, with a lot less risk. I mean, what we did in the early days of Top Deck out of the UK, you know, I'd be in jail now for probably. Um, but, yeah, just, and, and it's not because what I was doing there was necessarily dramatically illegal or anything, it was just that there are so many more rules now. So setting up a business, uh, you know, of any kind uh, is not necessarily that easy. But um, I, I think if people want to, I think there's still plenty of opportunities it, it, in, in certain areas. Whether corporates can help, um, I, I, think, I think if you have a, you know, some sort of an entrepreneurial attitude within an organisation, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunities. And one of the things I say to our people, or, and again, I don't think anyone takes any notice of me, but is that, you know, the, the best, the best thing that someone can say to me, I reckon, is that I want my, I want my kid when they finish university or go and work for flight centre, because they'll look, what, be, not not because of what they'll earn, because the, the money will probably not be great at all, but um, from what they will learn um, in terms of uh, leadership and business and what we can give them that, and and to me that's one of the things we really need to be doing so that we can be proud that people, people do, um, inside and outside our company, want their kids to start off in, in our organisation because of those reasons. Not, not because of blind loyalty or our culture or anything like that, but because they really do value, um, <clears throat> or they think the kids can get a lot out of it and then can move on to other things. They don't have to stay with us for the rest of their lives, and, and most of them won't. Now, talking about just the younger generation for a moment, your son, Matt, hmm. has the, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. He started 99 Bikes, right? Uh, has he got the flight centre way or what? Oh, look, very much. Uh, Matt started uh, 99 Bikes at Milton, um, basically with no, no help from Matt. Well, I gave him plenty of advice, but no help. <laughs> um, and, and he basically did the normal flight centre courses, you know, team, um, um, novice and uh, team leader, area leader and that sort of thing and, and you know, running a bike shop, it's a retail shop with stock of course, um, but the basic way it's set up and run is, is very similar um, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's uh, it, I think he has a, well, the, there are 11 shops now, we also have a wholesale division run by someone else but they work together and, and it's, uh, it's making reasonably good profit this year for the first time. And so, but, you know, that's, that's a matter of growing and, and it's a reasonably difficult market as well. Mm. But um, it, it very definitely is based on basic mm. flight centre systems, but uh, it's quite a different business as well. Is that about four, five years? Isn't it? Yeah, it was five probably years six years. Six then. years. Another question? Yeah, just over here. Thanks. Hi, sorry, two Hi. questions. Firstly, um, Absolutely loved the book Family Village Tribe by Mandy Johnson. Um, can we expect to see part two of that and the updated version? And secondly, in a lot of companies you see when there's been an inspirational leader um, and they step aside, retire, whatever, quite often be it private or publicly listed company, the company takes a hit in one form or another, be it um, share price, be it staff turnover at an executive level, do Flight Centre have a um, succession plan there for you or succession planning throughout the senior level? Okay, uh, good question actually. Family, Village and the Tribe, which is the book. Um, are, are you, you're not a commission agent for Mandy, are you? <laughs> because, uh, no, the book is out in the next couple of days. Uh, it's, it essentially is an update and, and works from um, when the other one finished, I think 2004, five up to the current um, mm the current time, so it's literally, it's being um, printed right now apparently, so, um, so you'll be able to get a copy in the next, couple, next week probably. Um, the other question was, uh, was it about? Succession. Oh, succession. succession yeah, look, I don't like talking about that. Or someone might, I might die in my sleep or something, you know. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, we've got quite a few senior leaders with quite a bit of experience. That have, you know, most of them have come up through the ranks uh, some quite proficient accountants who are in operational roles even, which is, yeah, I know it might sound a miracle to people, but it does happen sometimes. Um, and uh, so I, I, I don't, you know, um, I don't have any particular 
plan to step aside shortly. And I think you've just got to be a bit careful with succession um, because, you know, um, boards, when they have a good successor, like using it. And uh, so then you get out of a job. Uh, but I think also you don't want to get obsessed with succession. I think um, in any sort of leadership, you, you need people who can move up and take the next level. You know, that's, that's one of the key things. And I can absolutely assure you, we never have enough people ready to get, into, get up to the next level. And I, I, I don't know any company um, who has, but I'm sure there are some out there. Just on the privatisation, you were going to privatise the company. You couldn't get the 75% vote. You uh, would have taken on a billion dollars in debt at that time. Mm. How do you feel about it now? The fact that you missed out on a privatisation. Uh, yeah, well, that, that was a fairly tough period. There's someone in the room knows a bit about it, don't they, Tim? Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, privatisation. It was when our share price was quite low. It was um, uh, not not in the GFC. I think it was eight or nine dollars, and uh, we decided it was would be feasible with a private equity partner to privatise. Um, in the end, the, the founders held 50%, so we had to get 75% of the other 50% to agree, and we didn't quite get it over the line. Uh, and that was just not that long before the GFC. So uh, it would have been a pretty interesting ride. Uh, and that's, if you talk about risks that might mm. keep you awake at night, um, that might have been one of them. Yeah. But luckily we don't have to uh, say what happened because we don't know. So, uh, so how I feel about now, yeah, you just got to move on, and uh, it could have been the best thing we ever did. Um, it could have been a disaster. Do you want to comment, Tim? No. Next question. Hi there. I just want to ask, um, did you ever think at the beginning when you first started that you would become this successful? And also, what was um, your biggest mistake? <laughs> There's too, too, too many big mistakes. But um, look, not, not really, but I think... Uh, as I said before, the little, the bit of a story about getting the shopping centres, you know, um, you know I, I don't know why, but I've always personally been a bit of an empire builder. You know, never, it was never enough to have one bus or two or three. You know, we had to have seven. And the, the only reason we don't, Top Deck doesn't have 500 buses now is because, or well, all gone broke, um, is because Jude and I left uh, to come back to Australia. So. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep growing the bus numbers. Uh, so, you know, if, if you predict that out, and, and with a, a, a large element of luck, because, you know, you've got, to, you've got to have the luck to be able to keep growing and, and survive and get through some of the rough patches that just about any business will have over a 40-year period. Um, I'm like, train of thought's not good, is it? What no, was it? That's, that's hey? Oh, mistake, the big mistakes. The Look, biggest mistake you made. Yeah, it's probably pretty obvious, and if you read about it in the book, uh, it's, it's in the uh, last six years, actually. So it's in the, it's, it's in the last part of the book. Okay. <laughs> now, come on. Come on, give us the mistake. Um, yeah, essentially what happened is somehow we had this bright idea of getting, um, I think it was Bain and Company in to... You know, all the challenges we've got, we knew about, we'd heard about, uh, particularly with the internet and that, get someone in to advise us on where, we, where we're going and, and what we need to do, or help us work out what we need to do. And, um, you know, this, this took a life on its own, of its own, and uh, whenever you get corporate advisors in, if you like, it, um, you know, unless you really run the process tightly, it can be a disaster. And that, that was called full throttle. And um, if, you, if you're anyone at Flight Centre Limited that was around at the time uh, in Australia will um, we'll know about it. So I asked them about what their story was. But it wasn't a pleasant story. And it was basically because we didn't take enough control of the actual process. Uh, the Bain, you, we could blame them, but it's really our fault. And uh, it was a pretty dark period in our re reasonably recent history. And uh, I'm not joking. I could, you know, it's a reasonably long story. But um, it, it is explained in some detail in the book, and uh, yeah. Any, any of those uh, any of those strategies survive? Oh, look, there's probably bits and pieces that that we got out of it, you know. But um, no, it was it, it wasn't so much the strategies; it was losing 
control of the process. Okay. Okay. There's a question there. Then the one up the back. Yeah. Um, firstly, thanks very much for your insights. It's been a very interesting evening. Um, the, second, the, the second question is really at, at a macroeconomic level, what do you think Australia as a country as a whole needs to do to be more competitive or improve its competitiveness in the market? You know, you run an international business where you'd see lots of insight. What, what do you think we need to do to be better in the world economy? Uh, I mean, th there's probably a whole range of things. And I must admit, it's one of the things that you, you, know, you, you, you work in a certain uh, economy, you know, whether it's Australia or New Zealand or somewhere else, and you just got to accept the rules that are there by the, you know, put down, laid by, down by the politicians. But th there's no doubt that the inflexibility of our, uh, our workplace uh, you know, the, the rules around this, uh, you know, a real burden. Uh, and it's not just the money, you know, be, be, it, it's, it's what you have to do. And, and probably in our, the main, main industries where and it's not too bad, uh, but certainly I know in the hospitality industry, it's, 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 it's really hard to run uh, these hotels profitably because of the inflexibility of, of what you've got to do quite often. And uh, that's, that's probably the biggest thing we see directly. But there's probably a lot of other things as well that could be done to, to improve it. it. It just depends on whether, um, whether people are prepared. You know, it's a bit like the, have you heard about the NBN? Is it NBN? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's look, if, if you give everyone a free, uh, you know, a free Holden, uh, or you give them the choice, we'll give you a free Holden or a free Rolls Royce, what do you want? You know, I mean, people are probably going to, most people are probably going to take the free Rolls Royce, but it just depends whether you can afford it, whether the country can afford it. Everyone wants it. Everyone wants. Everyone wants everything. You can see that in the in the. But it's, it is whether the country can afford it. And if you see the countries that are in really serious trouble, you know, places like Ireland, Spain, and Greece. I mean, they've all overspent, and uh, and 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 they've spent the 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 people that are growing up. They've spent their future. You know, they're, they're going to grow up in a country that's going to be in debt for 50 years. And the states in the UK are not that far behind. Yeah, but screw you, just came back from Europe. I've just come back from Europe five weeks over there. And consumer confidence levels in Greece, Spain, Italy and other countries, when there's a couple of basket cases there, mm. there are, those confidence levels are above ours. Mm. You know, we've got this miracle economy we keep hearing about, but the consumer confidence levels yeah. seem to be way down. There's a question right at the back. Screw that. Very early this evening, you made a very subtle and I thought a very modest reference to having $1.2 billion cash in your pocket. I'd like your thoughts as leader. How do you manage that amount of cash? And how close an interest do you take in money markets, currency markets, foreign exchange, and all that other accounting type stuff? Yeah, well, um, yeah, well that one, to, it's not actually in my pocket. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, we have quite a, a reasonably uh, sophisticated treasury area. Uh, we also do a lot of currency um, trading. Um, you know, we, 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 don't take, uh, we don't take bets on it. It's generally when we have positions, uh, use, obviously uh, um, we buy a lot of hotels in, um, in different currencies and it's, it's only when we have the actual business that we buy it and that sort of thing. So, so we're, we're reasonably sophisticated in um, you know, both in Treasury and in, uh, in the, um, in, in, I suppose, uh, trading currencies. We also have, uh, and, you know, I can assure you I don't get heavily involved. Our, our CFO is very competent. Uh, our our Treasurer is, is, is also very competent, despite the fact that he's a POM. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we forgive him for that. And um, we, we also encourage repatriation of funds back to Australia because that's where we get the best interest. So that's one of the reasons we have quite a high balance uh, here at any one time. Uh, and, and you know, they get rewarded for that through um, earning a higher interest rate than they would locally, of course. Chris, you've got time for one more question? Here? Yeah, just one more. Over here. Can you just put your hand up if you were... Uh, one at the back there. Thanks. I'm interested in uh, the relationship between Flight Centre and the airlines. Uh, it's quite interesting, obviously, you'd 
uh, Flight Centre would obviously bring in the most passengers for uh, Qantas and Virgin respectively, but at the same time they'd probably be your key competitors, especially in the online market. I'm curious how that relationship works and how um, perhaps that's evolved over the years and how airlines have seen Flight Centre as a small operator um, 20, 30 years ago versus uh, how they would perhaps see Flight Centre now. Yeah, it's a good question. I can assure you, you know, our, the relationship with our airlines um, uh, yeah, can be a little bit turbulent at times. Um, just have to ask Singapore Airlines about that. But anyway, uh, no, look, Qantas and Virgin, uh, they have become reasonably serious competitors now. And uh, we, w you know, we, we sell a lot of Qantas, but we also sell a lot of Virgin now. And we, we have a, a pretty strong relationship with both of them. Um, the difference is now, of course, that uh, Virgin is... Uh, getting seriously into the, the business, the corporate market. And uh, we're heavily in the corporate market, so there's a fair bit of pulling and, and shoving there. But um, the, there's no doubt they need us. One of the things, if you look at overseas, a lot of the major carriers there, like in the States or some of the other places, the UK, uh, particularly when they've got serious low-cost comp competition, um, you know, treat travel retailers uh, with a fair bit of disdain but uh, it, I can assure you that's not the case in Australia, um, New Zealand, Canada. Or, um, but you, know, you, you have to continually remind airlines how important we are uh, and occasionally use your market power, or no, that's, I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> use your, your market to, uh, to uh, make sure that they stay honest to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Graham Scruton. I would especially like to thank you, Screw. They were, they were wonderful insights into your business philosophy and um, I think uh, you're admirable for your single-mindedness because I think you said that um, you really started the, the main part of the business in the early 80s and I recall that that was about, a t about the time when everyone was saying that um, it would all be... Um, electronic and you wouldn't need travel agents and you wouldn't need anybody as the in intermediary. It was about the same time I joined a computer company and was told that that market was all over and there was no future in it. So I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a real testament to your leadership that you could see um, the growth of an industry which, you know, needed to be both people in front of other people as well as online. So it, it's been really inspiring to listen to you. And I'd also like to especially thank Ray for being such a, um, a, a good facilitator over the whole series. And um, I'd like you to thank both of them for their time. For those of you who'd like to revisit the conversation or share it with others, the webcast will be on the SLQ, the State Library of Queensland website, within a week with the rest of the series. And you might also be interested in attending the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame induction dinner, which will be held on the 25th of July at the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre. It promises to be an exciting evening with the announcement of this year's inductees and uh, guest MC Sharon Gadella from Seven News will join Ray Weeks to present the program, including entertainment from the Deep Blue Orchestra. If you're interested, tickets are now on sale via the website, which is hallofame.slq.qld.gov.au. And as we wrap up the Game Changer series for the year, um, we want to... Um, remind you all that the State Library of Queensland is here for all of you and so if you want to do more research or if you want to write books about or write stories about uh, entrepreneurs and business leaders then we'd welcome you here to um, use the collections and the material that's been built up as part of the Hall of Fame. And again, I'd make, like to make a special thanks to our sponsors, Crow Horworth, Channel 7, Origin and 4BC. Thank you for being such a, an engaged audience and we look forward to seeing many of you here next year. So I'd invite you now to join us on the Queensland Terrace for some refreshments and I encourage you to, to try to find somebody new to meet and talk to.
Thank you very much.